G'day, Kim. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. It's been a big week. It has. The chaos continues, doesn't it? Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I think we're both starting to get a bit tired. Nonetheless. Yes. See how we go today. Yeah. (laughs) We may struggle a bit. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, we may struggle a bit today. We've got a couple of interesting things today. I guess part of what we're going to talk today is about the difficulty HR continue to find itself in when they're brought a shit sandwich by operations Mm -hmm. and said this person's behaving badly and they're highly sensitised. Operations are sick of this person. Mm. They bring them an issue which is small but it's been blown up to being large and then HR go and investigate or don't investigate to try and deliver the outcome ops want and then it goes really badly in court. So we're going to deal with that a little later on, Mm. which is a bit of fun Mm. and because we know a lot of the people watching are our HR people and how frustrated they are by this process it's nice to have a bit of case law for them to go when you're asking me to do this i need you to understand what is the risk yeah. so that's part of the reason we're doing it but why it's so important to do a proper investigation that's the really the key issue isn't it? it is it's to step back and have, have that distance yeah. uh, to say to the people who bring you the problem well good but let mm-hmm. me let me test that yeah and be objective about yeah. it. yeah uh the other funny part is the, the model safety states and territories there's eight of them um act have now just adopted a code and regs for psychological safety yep great south australia come always a little bit slow on the uptake but victoria but victoria who's not one of the model states who is the second one out of the box to say we're going to do it who's published them now 18 months ago yeah still haven't adopted them Mm. but uh, anyone who's prosecuted them true so, so we're doing something. <laughs> doing something. All right, look, let's go on to our first case, which is Yusuf and Bev Chain. Kim, interesting case. This is a forklift accident case. Yeah, so guy operating a forklift, other forklifts in the area, he was reversing back and collided with his colleague who'd come around a corner and he suffered a quite a severe back injury as a result. So this is a common law claim. Common law claiming negligence by the injured worker against the employer for the vicarious liability of the employee. Yep. And because what the um, employer tried to demonstrate was that the employee who was reversing wasn't negligent, and yep. which is one of the defences for vicarious liability under which they failed. Yeah, and also for contributing negligence to actually reduce the scale of the damages yeah, well, that are ultimately going to be that's awarded. Right. Yeah, he was 30% liable for his own injuries. Yeah, so just understand the history of contributing mm. negligence is once a long time ago, if you were in any way negligent, you wiped out vicarious liability. And so in every state and territory now, there's contributing negligence mm. legislation that looks at it based on the percentage of causation. Yeah. But the key fact here is the safe operating procedure. <laughs> that actually said what safe looks like in a workplace. Mm. Um, and I, you'll hear Kim and I talk about policies and procedures and process a lot, because that's actually where a judge or a safety regulator goes to determine what is reasonably practical or what is the duty of care. Mm. Here, the reversing forklift driver was in breach of the safe operating procedure. And that's it, over Red Rover. Yeah. All he had to do was look over his shoulder. Yeah, that's all he had to do. And he didn't do it. And so you get to this case, which is a very old case called Bean's case. When can an employer not be liable for the actions Mm. of an employee? That is where you can show that everybody was competent in that policy and procedure and a person went off in a way that couldn't be controlled and went on frolic of their own, Mm. as the expression of the case, did Mm. their own thing. Under those circumstances, the employer can say, no, we're not liable and no court will hold you liable. But this was a case where the employer had a capacity to enforce Mm. a standard operating procedure and clearly the actions over a period of time didn't reflect that. It's important to note, though, that that extends to discrimination, harassment, sexual harassment claims. Yep. So if an employer has adequate um, policies and processes in place and they train their employees every year, we will not tolerate this type of And they're competent in it. And And they never condone it. Yep. Very okay, um, then you can actually say, no, no, you're on your own. And when I train, one of the things I say in sexual harassment is... Which you give to us every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of this training, it's your mortgage, not mine. Mm. Just be aware of yeah. it because that's the truth. Of it. Mm. Okay, look, let's jump to our next case. Okay. Funny case, this is the CFMEU case. Can I, a lot of people get really head up about entry rights. Okay, so... A union official has a right of entry in respect of safety, serves a notice of entry in accordance with the law in respect of a suspected breach. When they enter a site, if they have a reasonable basis for for determining 
that there may be another risk, they are entitled to investigate that. That is the end of it, not what happened here in Canberra contractors' case, because what happened here is, as the union officials with, um, you know, touch one, touch everyone, walking down the corridor, mm. truck came past, breeze blew on the guy, and he thought, geez, this is not a very safe place. Mm. And then the contractors tried to stop the union official in walking along further to see if it's risky. Mm. I don't know if you can be more stupid than that, really, because at that stage you'd be saying, let's do this together mm. and let's get it right, yeah. because you'd want to have a good relationship with the union rather than give them an easy win in the Fair Work Commission where they come and stick the finger up at you every time they work past. Yeah. But in this case, Canberra contractors allowed the union to go to the commission. The commission did the union's calling and said, of course they're entitled to do mm. this. They're a safety, they have a safety right of entry. Yeah. They have a reasonable basis for feeling there is a, another safety issue. You've got to help them. You can't hinder mm. them. Okay, it's so it's also an offence. Very quick one. Let's jump to something about bullying because I reckon, Kim, this is, this is the beginning of our roll into investigations, isn't it, really, today? Yeah. Um, Shockman is a case where a guy complained that one one of his co-workers said, no, I don't want to work with you and you're not to come to work function. Yeah. He alleged that was bullying and he said there was also some gossip about him that nobody wanted to work with him. Yeah. A good investigation was done that showed he was the bully. Yeah. And, yes, there was misconduct from the person who said, don't want to work with you, all the rest of it. But what the investigation revealed is the gossiping bad conduct of the complainant. Now, can you just see when someone raises bullying on the misconduct scale, mm. it's up the far end. Why? Because it is repetitive conduct, not just a once-off. Mm. It is repetitive conduct. It objectively causes hurt, humiliation or intimidation. And finally, it makes workplace unsafe. See the last bit, make workplace unsafe? Mm. At that stage, you've got to investigate. The moment there's an allegation of workplace is unsafe, you've got to investigate. They do an investigation and oh, look what happens. Mm. Can I just say to you, not all investigations require bells and whistles, okay? They don't require you to come in and scribble down everything. But what you've got to do is you've got to serve a notice on someone. You say, here's the allegations. Mm. You've got to go and then investigate those allegations. You've got to come back with findings. This didn't have to be done externally. This was a really simple mm. one. Could have been done in half a day. Probably was done in half a day. But at the end of it, you take control of your workplace again. And this is not where the criminals take over the jail. Yeah. This is where you own your workplace mm. because you do an investigation in accordance with your own value structures and law and everyone sees you do a good job. Mm. I reckon this is a great outcome in this mm. case. This oh, is, because this he, he was trying to use a stop bullying order to um, delay inevitable disciplinary action against him. Isn't it great? Stupid. stupid yeah, yeah. No, but it's lovely to see it happen. Oh, yeah. And once again, HR people, here's the opportunity to prove your value because mm. by being able to objectively, not getting caught up in the noise, get in and just do the right thing, you've got this guy on toast. All right, Kuma and Opal, the next case. Okay. I don't think I've jumped a case here. No, I haven't. No, no. <laughs> so this week, Mr. Kuma was, um, was alleged by HR and this is part of a series of cases we mm. want to talk about, yeah. that he hadn't done a lockout takeout procedure correctly. So there was a method of dealing with it. It required retraining every two years. Opal had not done that. Mm. The investigation was was a poor investigation mm. and it was done from a flawed premise. Yeah. Actually, what Kumar did was better version of what was supposed to be done under mm. the HR investigation. He was ultimately terminated and the court found it was wrongful. Mm. But what? We're just identifying this stuff, you know, mm. like if you've got a set of policies and procedures, what's the first thing you do? You've got to comply yourself. Yeah. So you've got to retrain. Yeah. Secondly, you never go to investigate without having absolute clarity about what good is. Mm. So if it was misconduct, Kim, you go to your values and look at what are the behavioural guidelines of what good looks like. Yeah. If it's OHS, I don't know, I'd go to the policies and procedures yeah. that describe lockout tagout. Then I would methodically go through exactly what it found out is this machine had been depowered and was not at risk. Mm. Imperfect but still safe. Yeah. Last part of investigation is don't try and be too smart by half on mm. my father's old sayings. Look at the practical truth of what has occurred and it may not be perfectly in accordance with policy but if it has exactly the same effect, retrain the person, yes, mm. but don't get caught up in the hysterics of it. Okay. okay, so let's just talk about a few cases that come after that. I've got yeah. young Tom. He's done a, He's done a sterling, job. sterling job again. Yeah. 
But I just want to go through a couple of very quick cases. There's a ca case called drawing and RTL mining. These are some old cases of a guy who went to check a water tank and left his Land Cruiser running <laughs> and it rolled down the hill and struck something, not a person. They sacked him. It was a site where there was huge condemnation of other forms of safety misconduct. And on the scale of it, this wasn't that bad and nobody got hurt. The investigation failed to pick up the other risks, failed to pick up that there was a low risk of injury in it, failed to do everything that was necessary. And the court just looked at them and said, this is a really flawed investigation. Mm. You've got condemnation of bad behaviour that exists on site. You can't possibly terminate this. But remember, condemnation of these says you can't punish what you permit. Mm. And it's permitted across the site. Going down to McDonald and Whitehaven, um, this was another case where there was alleged a very strong basis for the termination of a person. The investigation once again reflected what operations wanted in it rather than mm. looked at was this really a strong case of wrongdoing? Mm. And actually when the court looked into it, they went, no, this is not a really strong case of wrongdoing. Mm. You've looked through the wrong eyes. Now, we could go through all Tom's other cases. We're going to run out of time, mm. so we're not going to do that. But my point about all of this is when someone brings you a problem in HR or safety, it's usually a problem they have tolerated for a long time because mm. people are most reluctant in Australian culture to complain about people. I know that's not the common experience, but it's certainly your and mine, isn't mm. it? So it usually means they've developed a level of sensitivity to the person they're dealing with, yeah. and this was the straw that broke the criminal's back. And they bring it to you as the worst example of bad behaviour. When the, By the time it gets to us, Kim will come to me and goes, do you reckon this is bad behaviour? I go, nah. <laughs> she go, they think it is. <laughs> and I do the same to Kim. Be very careful about operational hyperbole around what is bad. Mm. Take... It's, it's often uh, personality conflict. Oh, they just say, we just, he's got to go, we've got to get rid of him at all costs. That's right. Yeah. So... Like a lawyer does, which is always go back to the source of law before they give any advice. So if it's a contract, you go back to the contract and the legislation. When someone brings you an investigation, go back to the founding facts. What are the policies and procedures, the code of conduct? Good. What is the true evidence of what has occurred before? Speak to all witnesses, Speak to which all is wit what a lot of them don't do. Yeah. They just sort of pick and choose who they think will give them the evidence yeah. that they want. Be aware of condemnation mm. that sits out there. Condemnation is where someone approves of misconduct. Now, there comes a stage where serious misconduct that places someone's life in jeopardy won't interfere in your capacity to terminate. Mm. But day-to-day -day misconduct, which has been approved for other people doing it, A, is a psychological hazard because it's a different way of treating people based on who you know. Mm. But secondly, the doctrine of condemnation applies and you can't discipline them. You have to reset, you have mm. to start all over again. Yeah. So remember, when someone brings you a problem, it's usually been a problem of some time. It's often personality-based. Mm. Go back to the raw facts. Go back to the sources of legal obligation that sit. Then prepare the letter of allegations as to what is the breach that is alleged, not the f just the facts. Yeah. What is... Andrew spoke rudely to Jenny by saying the following words. Now, in your mind, when you draft that allegations letter, what is the breach? You go to your these. Okay. That is an allegation, in fact, because it breaches this. Mm. So I know why I'm writing it out. Yeah. And if you do that down each of your allegations in your allegation letter, and please never do this without an allegations letter because it is the evidence of what you're investigating. It is the evidence of the misconduct. At that stage, you find half of it's rubbish. Mm. And you go, okay, no, I can't allege that, I can't allege that. Oh, that was six months ago and nothing happened and mm. more, yeah. And you end up with some allegations you can prove, yeah. but they might be as serious as you thought, okay? So mm. that's our learning, isn't it, really? Well, also, it's we haven't talked about the opportunity of the person to actually respond properly to those allegations, so you've got to give them adequate time, notice, invite the support person. Yeah. I'll put the EAP if you have it, the usual things. Okay. Now let's get on to our topic for today, which is the case of Lindsay Swift and Highland Pine. Okay. Oh. Kim. He's a horrible, horrible man. <laughs> yeah, Lindsay and he, Swift. And I'll give you Kim his home <laughs> address for any litigation that, <laughs> that you need to issue, because the vicarious liability just got oh. cut there. But this is a, an appalling case of a guy who, and we, Kim and I, I think it's really just to cause shock, have fun, taunt, whatever it is. Yeah. 
said a whole range of things range to people, things. things to both women and men mm. in an organisation. Nothing to do with whether he's attracted to them or not. But no. Kim, I've just made really um, regular comments to co-workers inquiring about their sexual activity, talking to them about his own, showing female co-workers, not that he was attracted to them or anything like that, photos of other women who were often bare-breasted um, and he would talk to female co-workers about having threesomes and that sort of thing. So not coming on to them as such, but lots and lots of sexual talk at the workplace. So um, uncomplicated sort of story, really in some mm. ways, shocking story. Mm and terminated for sexual harassment. Yeah. Is it sexual harassment? Well, it was unwelcome. None of these people asked for it to occur. Yeah. Um, it was reasonably foreseeable that they'd be offended by it or humiliated or... Yep. What, so that's what? a tick. And as I said, there had, was there any sexual advance, a request for favours or conduct of any sort of sexual nature? So tick with the... Tick is that. So there you, you've got the three, haven't you? Yeah. So sexual harassment. The, the point that Kim and I are raising the case today, and we've got a problem we're going to spend a bit of time agitating afterwards mm. to go through it is it doesn't matter in sexual harassment whether you intend to seduce the person it doesn't matter what your intent was at all mm. that actually if your intent was to cause pain or to hurt or to humiliate that aggravates it and that goes to damages and can include um, aggravated damages which are punitive damages so mm. here's you know in this case if it was a sexual harassment claim rather than a termination claim okay mm then there would certainly be an element of aggravated damages that would be sought against him, mm. okay? Yeah. Those awards at the moment are relatively small. They go between about, at the highest at the moment, it's about $50,000. But if we follow the American trend in damages for aggravated damages, which which we ultimately will do, mm. um, in a few years' time, we could be looking very substantial aggravated damages as punitive ways of stopping behaviour. But this was an ugly... Mm. repetitive set of facts that caused harm he knew would cause harm mm. and he almost delighted in doing mm. it i think so yes. it's a shocking case but none of it was with an intention to form a relationship and there's not a suggestion there is no. okay mm. so sexual harassment no intention to sexually harass but doing it is still sexual harassment mm. the more you can show an intention to any one of those elements like seduction or like hurting and humiliating the larger the claim becomes, the larger the general damage, and general damages are for, for loss of amenity, hurt, humiliation, loss of amenity, okay? They're, they're, they're substantial, and as since which is an oracle, non-touch forms of sexual harassment now range between about thirty dollars to $150,000. Mm. If this, if one of the people here brought it because if they were repeatedly subjected to it, you could expect if they just develop depression, they were unable to come to work, that type of stuff. Mm. Their general damages would be over $100,000. Mm. 2015, they would have been twelve dollars to $14,000. So that's the change because it's now aligning with the common law. Mm. So interesting. So why don't we mm. go on and have a look at the case study? Okay. <laughs> Put the binoculars on. Ingrid was the CEO of Osbridge, an engineering business listed on the ASX. Matteo was the Victorian sales manager. Although he earned north of 500,000 per annum, his base salary was 165,000 plus super, and the rest were sales-based bonuses. Matteo had struggled through the failure of his second marriage and was known to drink too much, especially at work-related functions. Not something we do. Never. Never. The Osbridge head office had a flash fit out. It was on the top three stories of Melbourne's newest skyscraper, levels 48, 9 and 50. But Friday night drinks had been going on since the day they opened their doors and the founder, now Chair Rob Hughes, Rob Hughes, was that, did I get that right? Yeah, I got Rob, Rob, Rob Hughes of everything you got. <laughs> Rob Hughes loved it. He said it helped to rally the troops. Matteo didn't think much of Ingrid. He, in fact, he thought she was ugly and stuck up. At the end of financial year drinks, Matteo got plastered. Rob suggested he go home and Matteo pretended to leave but actually retired to the rooftop garden for a smoke. In the hour or so before leading up to Rob's intervention, Matteo had commented on multiple women's cleavage, told one woman she was hot and generally leered at women under the age of 30. None of this was unusual and there were other men who attended this and other functions who behaved the same. Everyone knew drinks finished at 7 p.m. At 7.05, Matteo came down from the roof to floor 48 where his 
Rob's and Ingrid's offices were located. Ingrid and Rob were in the boardroom discussing quarter one of 23, 4, I think I might have said this. I might have cut it out, but Ingrid was the CFO. Oh, okay. Yeah. I watched, can't remember. Um, when Matteo burst through the door, he saw they were drinking single malt whiskey, poured himself single, I love this, several fingers of the dark peaty fluid, <laughs> sculled it and came over to Ingrid and asked, what is, such a, what is such a hot, sexy creature like you doing out, hanging out with the chair? You could have any man you like. For example, me. Why go for crusty old chair? Rob convulsed with laughter. Ingrid pushed Matteo's hand away from her buttock where it had been resting and screamed at him and stormed out. She was obviously distressed and overcome by his conduct. Okay. Good one. Good one. <laughs> I love your <laughs> studies. Well, I was actually having a glass of very good wine, <laughs> like, like, a, like a Roland at the time. So okay. that's why I could say it was clear that Matteo had no sexual interest in Ingrid. Was the conduct towards her sexual harassment and discrimination? Interesting argument here because it's both. Yeah. Um, it's clearly sexual harassment because it's unwelcome. Yeah. It hurt, humiliated. Yeah. Um, and it was of a sexual nature. Yeah. Okay. It didn't matter that he thought she was ugly and stuck up, up and, and had no sexual attraction to No, her. but it was obviously made in a sexualised manner and exactly. therefore it was. Yeah. But it was also unwelcome behaviour uh, based on her gender, mm. which may, is a protected attribute. Um, which demeaned her, mm. and therefore it is discrimination as well. Yeah. So really quite serious. I don't think people quite understand the discrimina discrimination aspect of sexual harassment. Mm. It's very real and it is a compounding feature in litigation that you allege both. Mm. And what happens is, I haven't asked the question here, is it a hostile workplace? But that will now also mm. be pleaded because this is clearly a hostile workplace yeah. and therefore the combination of harassment, discrimination and hostile workplace will double general damages like that, mm. okay? And that's how a plaintiff law firm will argue it, yeah. okay? It'll say women aren't safe, mm. women are treated differently, discrimination, she was treated differently, discrimination, and then she was harassed repeatedly mm. by this guy, mm. bang, big claim for yeah. GDs, okay? The following day, Matteo's employment was summarily terminated for sexual harassment of several women and especially Ingrid, would, would he have a successful summary dismissal case? And I refer you to Keenan and Leighton Burrell. Mm -hmm. I think the last part's not quite spelt correctly, but that's me. Is there a jurisdictional argument to reject the claim? So let's go jurisdictional argument. Uh, it's 167,000 from, yeah, from 1 July. So he's under that on base pay, super and bonuses if they're discretionary or based on a performance related thing rather yeah. than fixed. Do not come within it, yeah. high income threshold. Therefore, he's got an unfair yes. dismissal claim. He'd win the jurisdictional argument. Yeah. I want to just stop here and let everyone breathe through it because <laughs> everyone has said, and I can hear them say, he's got to go. Mm. Well, that's not quite the full court setting. Mm. Keenan. Keenan was a case where a guy behaved just like this, and at the after party, upstairs, away from the party, he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. He then sexually harassed the HR manager. <laughs> so you would have thought he was a dead duck. Mm. Legislation around employees in Australia is beneficial. That is, it's designed to protect employees. So in this case, Ingrid has a lay down Mazzea, and we'll talk about that, mm. and any claim she wants to bring. Yeah. But he is protected as an employee mm. around whether this is harsh, unjust, or unreasonable. Okay. Mm. Now, he's a bloke. We're going to presume for the purpose that he's been working there a while. This behaviour has been condoned through the business. So do you see harsh is already in the game? Mm. So when we look at it, is it a valid reason? Yes. Yeah. But if other people are not terminated and they do the same thing, it's unquestionably harsh. Yeah. So the, the nasty answer to this is it's a line ball. Mm. And you'd have to terminate him, but you'd be doing a deal because he could win. Yeah. Because Keenan did. Yeah. And Keenan's behaviour was much worse than his. Mm. Mm. Okay. True. So look, I just thought I'd raise it because mm. people often don't get it. Yeah. But I guess it's hard hard not to say this without giggling. We, we don't harass women at work. Mm. We don't let anyone do it. We stop them. Mm. We we take really serious steps. We have process. We don't treat people differently. We just go. No women are safe at work. You've now got positive duties. Mm. 
So if you didn't believe it before, you've got to believe it now because liability is just running at you. Okay, let's go to the third question. Kim, I'll let you read. Oh, we hadn't finished that one. Anyway. Have we? What was the... Well, I think my only point that I wanted to make that he was summarily terminated the next day, so it was clear that there hadn't been a proper investigation process. Okay. So it would fail on that basis as well. There you go. That's the part I didn't. We won't go backwards, but you're right, Kim, <laughs> and that just shows that I didn't read my own script. Okay, so number three. Kim. Would Ingrid have a successful sexual harassment discrimination claim and general protections claim against Rob, Osbridge and Mateo? If so, assuming she was unable to return to work and was on 350k per annum and aged 49, what would be her damages? So I think we can deal with first and easy. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the moment, she got a general damages claim over $100,000 probably, but certainly between 80 to 120 would be a safe landing spot. Mm -hmm. Unable to return to work, there would be a significant discount. Just remember, and we'll talk about common law afterwards. Mm -hmm. What's been imported over into damages for sexual harassment has been the tariff, that is the amount, not the mechanisms of actual damages assessment. So yeah. I just want that to be clear. Yeah. There has not been big special damages claims made, and special damages are what you call in the common law loss of earning capacity. They're inclined to look at past loss of earning capacity and then give a bit of a lump mm. going forward. Mm. Um, not the way, and we'll talk about common law damage yeah. in a second. We've got no evidence about medical costs. They'd be relatively small in any event. Yeah. So the issue here is, so just say it's about $100,000. She's certainly going to lose a year. So she's already at, say, $500,000. Yeah. Yeah. She's so senior, her age is 49, difficult to get back in the market. Yeah. Mm. I'm on the other side of that. <laughs> I'm well on the other side of that. <laughs> so she'd probably end up with special damages of, maybe over a million, okay? Mm. okay? So she's worth somewhere between about a million to 1.5 million. But can I just say Rob's going to be liable for that? The company is going to be liable for that? Mm. It's not just... Mm. So the issue is will the company indemnify Rob? Yeah, totally it'll indemnify Rob. But just imagine if you, you're insured for this, okay? Mm. Can you imagine your premium? Can you imagine what the insurer mm -hmm. is going to do with you? Imagine if you don't disclose quickly to the insurer mm. that this has occurred and they refuse indemnity. Suddenly you've got $1.5 million yeah. just coming straight out. Then imagine what it does reputationally to you as a mm. listed stock mm. exchange mm. with a chair that's been sued. Mm. Your share price is going to die. Mm. Um, have a look at the contracts that you have, if they're government-based contracts, if they're banking-based contracts around development. All of them have clauses around sexual harassment and safety, which make it a basis to terminate contracts. Mm. This is a much bigger issue than the damages. I, I just want to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. All right, for Kim. Uh, would Ingrid have a successful work cover claim and common law claim in Victoria? If so, what would be the premium impact? So we've got head office premium is currently 140000 a year and the business premium, which we'll talk about the difference, is around $3 million. Um, would she get up on a serious injury claim, which is common law? And if so, what would her claim be worth? So yes, common law, because we can, we'll, she'll be undoubtedly be able to demonstrate she suffered an injury, and it's happened out of in the course of employment. So yeah. threshold test tick. Yep. Um, if she suffered a severe impact um, on her life, which will be her loss of earnings, she'll get the serious injury yep. um, threshold. To have common law damages, she will need to claim negligence against her employer. She'll be able to demonstrate that against Rob quite easily because he laughed and he didn't do anything to prevent the behaviour from occurring. Yep. So common law claim tick. Um, and a damage. Oh, I'm just... Yeah, reading. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So damages would be, unlike what you said before, there's a different calculation for common law claim. That'd be an actuarial table. Yeah. And then and go out to age of 65 with contingencies knocking back by about 20 or 30%. Yeah. So she's so five or six million, million, yeah, five or six million dollar yeah, claim. Yeah. GDs would still be around about the same. They, they'd be okay. Mm. But, but it's the loss of earning capacity. Loss of earning yeah. capacity is the killer. And look, the other one, just very quickly for Kim, is in the workers' comp stage, this is one of the very few business where head office is separate yeah. from the actual work in the like business. Physically separate. Separate. And yeah. therefore, there will be a separate premium. Okay. Mm. So how much would it be if it was capped out over a three year cycle in Victoria? Okay. So. Um, well, it's just gone up from 30% capping. So a 30% cap on any premium would double the premium after the three years, after it's been on there for three years. Now it's up to 75%. So 
So their premium would go up from 140,000 to 750,000 after three and if, years. For and, if it, and if it was an embedded head office, so it was a head office. Oh, it'd be millions. It'd be seven and a half million potentially. I don't, I don't mm, know. Scary stuff, isn't it? it? Is anyway, million. so I just thought we'd just raise that because it's an interesting issue around yeah. classifications. Mm. Let's go to question five because we have officially run out of time. Uh, were the actions of Rob? Rob and Osbridge breached a safety law. What type of breach? What are the penalties? Assume that she died in these circumstances. She mm. ran out of the place and was knocked over while it, while she was in a dissociated state from the pain of it. Yeah. The answer is this is reckless endangerment. And because she died, even though it's leaving work, Rob's laughter at an obvious breach, mm. it's a risk of industrial manslaughter. So I just want you to know this is a safety prosecution and Victoria, they are prosecuting yeah. it. So I won't go into too much because it's time, Kim. Love to catch up. We made it to the other side. Thumbs up. See you later.